Hello everyone, happy Saturday to you all and day three of Mini Stravaganza. My goodness has it been a ride and we're not even done. Today is perhaps the most ambitious, the most exciting day yet. We have a ton of great content coming your way. It is day three of our global campaigns for both Unconventional Warfare, if you play the Star Wars games X-Wing, Legion, or Armada. Be sure to check out the updates that were posted earlier before this stream even began. Get those games in. We're right at the breakneck pace where we're going to be picking the final winner with light side or dark side, and that will determine the cards that will be going in future RP kits for alternate art options. So if you want to have a say in that, hop on the website, click those buttons, play those games as safely as you can, however you can, and we will announce the, the winner, the winning side for Unconventional War for tonight, along with our global campaign for Marvel Crisis Protocol, Civil War, also tons of results, it's been awesome. Uh, I'm still I'm still rooting for my team, my pro registration team. So let's let's get those votes in for Tony Stark and Iron Man. Uh, hashtag Tony was right, no question. Uh, so you still have time for that as well. And of course, remember if you didn't get a chance to play this weekend, those uh, game materials are going to stay up on the website, so you can play them anytime you want. You can recreate this amazing event anytime you want in the safety of your own home with your gaming communities. However you want to do it in the future, you can play with these rules. Uh, and have fun and recreate the battles that we experienced over the last three days. With that said, welcome everybody. I'm Will Schick, Director of Product Development here for Atomic Mass Games. This is probably the day I've been waiting for the most because now I get to do my favorite thing in the world, which is to teach folks some Hobby 101 basics. So if you're a veteran of the hobby, hopefully uh, some things that I do here in terms of how I approach the hobby will help inform and inspire you to try some new things or make you think about things different. If you're brand new and you've never picked up clippers, you've never picked up a paintbrush, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. Uh, I can't even contain myself. I'm gonna be really animated and silly today, not only because it's day three, but because this is literally my favorite part of the job. I'm gonna be sharing all of the things that I've learned over the last 30 plus years of hobby miniature gaming. Yes, I am that old. It is crazy to think about. Uh, but I picked up a lot of tips and tricks along the way because I've had great mentors. And I think one of the amazing things about the hobby that you'll find if you've never been involved in hobby miniatures before is that everybody is interested in bringing new people in. It's a very welcoming community and we love it when new people get to improve their skills, to build on skills, and we like sharing our secrets. So as we go through today, I want you to think of this a lot like cooking. I use a lot of cooking metaphors when we talk about painting because to me, they're one and the same. I love cooking and I love hobby miniatures and the painting aspect. What does that mean? It means that I'm gonna show you some recipes. I'm gonna show you how to do some things very specifically in the way that I do them. But what I want you to know is that these things are not meant to be hard and fast rules. I'm gonna demonstrate different techniques, show you some ideas, some very tried and true methodology that you can practice on your own, you can replicate and copy, but as you get more comfortable with them, as you grow in terms of your hobby skills, as you learn more information, don't feel like this is the only way to do things. Find things that feel great to you, that express the art the way you want to express, because everybody's hobby is unique and different. And that's a really big thing that I think we lose sometimes when it comes to these things. So I'm trying to teach you not just how to do things, how to approach things for the first time, but also to equip you with the skills that you need to basically play jazz on your own. We'll switch to a music metaphor. It's just like when you make a recipe for food for the first time, you follow the recipe exactly, you try it, you're like, this was okay. I, I think we could do better. I want a little more salt. I want a little more paprika. I want to add some coriander. This is the way that you go. And then you start exploring and expanding upon that recipe and you make something that's truly your own and nobody else can really craft that in the kitchen. So your family comes over, they always want that meal. Hobby is exactly the same way. So again, take this foundation as a foundation that it is, practice it, and then perfect it on your own. Find the things that work for you. So if I tell you something and you have some experience with the hobby, you're like, that's not how it works. That's okay too. Maybe just take the information, bend it in, learn from it, and then evolve your own style because that's the great part. Again, it's a very creative enterprise and everybody does things different. I've never met painters that do things the exact same way. We all have our different takes and that makes our art beautiful and it makes it our own. So with that said, I'm gonna get this camera off my face. We're gonna dive into Hobby 101. Thank you very much again for joining me. I can't wait to go on this journey together with you. So to kick things off, the very first thing that is important to note is that you need some materials, okay? What materials do you need to be able to start with the hobby? Well, the most important ones to get things started is that all miniatures for the hobby miniatures games come unassembled if you are playing Marvel Crisis Protocol or Star Wars Legion. You need the materials to get the miniatures from parts to completed miniatures. So we're going to take this frame 
and we're going to turn it into this completed miniature, this Craven the Hunter. Um, if you play Armada or X-Wing, this section might not be as useful to you because you can obviously do everything that we're going to do when we start talking about actually painting the miniatures. And we're going to go through some of those tips and tricks as well so that you can customize your squads and your fleet. Um, but if you're playing Marvel Crisis Protocol, you're absolutely going to get a frame like this and you're going to have to put that together. If you're playing Legion, you're going to also get frames like this. You might also just get parts in a bag depending on which faction that you're playing. The methodology for assembling these things is exactly the same, um, but I'm going to talk about two different adhesives that you can use, one of which only works if the miniature parts come on a frame like this, so they come in hard plastic, and one of which works for both ways, but only works um, for the soft plastic that comes through much, much better. So with that said, what do we need? The most basic tools that you need, and there are a lot of tools out there that you can get, but the, most, the two most basic tools if you want to get started are hobby clippers, which you can find at any hardware store or hobby store. Um, don't worry about the brand, like as long as they have a nice like snip snip action and they're sharp, you're good. And then you're gonna need a hobby knife. Okay, and there's a ton of different styles of these. Again, you can find them at hardware stores, you can find them at hobby stores. You can kind of get these from anywhere. Um, you wanna be very careful, they're very sharp. My, my often uh, trick is that when I switch out the blade, I always stab myself because I'm just not paying attention. Um, you do need to have blades, so the blades do come off. They are replaceable, they will dull over time. So you wanna make sure that you're keeping your blade nice and sharp by shifting them out. Uh, when you're done with the blade, safety tip, if you don't have a blade um, replacement box that like allows you to put the used blades inside something that's safe, like a little sharps box, what I like to do is take scotch tape and just wrap it around like six times around the blade. And that ensures that there's no way that anyone's gonna get stabbed. It's not gonna poke through your garbage or anything like that. So again, you wanna be very careful with these. You wanna pay attention to what you're doing, but a little bit of care will take you a long way. And this is these two tools are gonna to walk you through all of your assembly in terms of getting those parts ready for gluing. So what do we use for glue? There's a ton of different options again. The two main options are plastic glue or plastic cement. Uh, there's a ton of different options out there that you can find, again, mostly at hobby stores. So this is gonna be kind of hobby store specific. So if you're looking for plastic glue, go to the hobby store section, um, you know, the hobby modeler section where you see like the model airplanes and stuff like that. That's where you'll find that. Again, your game store is gonna have these uh, materials as well if they're selling hobby miniatures. So there's a lot of different places where you can find this stuff. This plastic glue comes in like 5,000 different varieties. There's uh, no smell, there's odorless, there's non-toxic, there's thin, there's thick, there's quick drying, there's slow drying. End of the day, uh, it doesn't really matter. You're gonna find which one works best for you. I personally, for these miniatures, prefer uh, the extra thin or thin versions of the cement. And the reason that I like that is because they typically come with a little applicator tip. So when I open this up, you're gonna see that it comes with a little brush. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to control the glue uh, immediately from the bottle itself. So you kind of can just paint it on. The other nice thing about the extra thin or the thin stuff is that it will work with capillary action. So instead of actually having to paint the glue on, you can actually just touch the piece that you want to put glue to. And that glue, because it's so thin and it wants to run, will kind of run through uh, the part of the miniature. So. If you look here at this backside, you can see how we have these connection points, these plugs and how the two halves come. When you touch that, that thin cement to one of these parts, it's going to run through capillary action because uh, liquids are amazing. And it's gonna coat all of this without you having to go through and paint it all. So it's a really easy way to get pretty good coverage and control over the glue. Now it can not have a bond as strong as some thicker cements. So you may find, depending on what you're working on, if it's a bigger vehicle or something that's really chunky and heavy, when it comes to hard plastic, you might want the thicker version of the plastic cement, but whatever you use is fine. If you don't use the thin stuff, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how I like to apply um, this next item that we're gonna talk about, which is super glue. Um, super glue is a pretty fantastic material. This plastic glue will only and this is really important, it will only adhere hard plastic. So miniatures that come on a frame. If you try to use this on say, um, some of the Legion soft plastic kits, so stormtroopers or rebel troopers from the uh, Rebellion era core set, 
it won't work. And the reason it won't work is because they're two very distinct types of plastic. And the chemical reaction that works with this plastic glue is that it actually uh, destroys, it kind of, it denatures the molecules in the hard plastic formula. And so what it does is it melts it and then it resets it. And that's what makes the bond incredibly strong and really ideal for this type of material because you're actually fusing the two parts together. Um, it cannot do that with soft plastic. The, the nature of the material, the molecular stru structure of the materials do not allow plastic glue to work. So if you try to use this on soft plastic, and again, the most easy indicator, if you don't know what I'm talking about, is does it come on a frame like this? It's hard plastic. This glue will work. If it doesn't come on a frame like this, it comes in a little baggie with all the parts just individually. It is soft plastic and this glue will not work, okay? So that is a super important kind of thing to go. Um, again, you can use, I, you know, I know that, I know that super glue is kind of like the Kleenex of this type of glue. I can't pronounce the actual scientific word. So cyto and it's sad, it's bad, it's bad, bad. Uh, it has a fancy name. You know exactly where it is. You, you can find it. Um, so when do, when do I use this? Again, soft plastic materials have to have this, this fancy glue, the super glue. Um, in order to stick. They won't, they won't work with this. You can also use this material on hard plastic. Now, um, the difference in terms of how these two bonds will work on hard plastic is again, this one denatures and fuses the plastic pieces together. It makes it an extremely strong bond. Um, but what that means is, is that it can also be kind of tricky to work with because if you have to reset a piece, you've now fused them together. So you have more working time with this typically, but once it's there, it's there for good. Um, some people don't like that. Uh, our creative director, Dallas Kemp, doesn't actually use plastic glue for anything. He, he prefers super glue. I go back and forth between them depending on what I'm gluing. Um, I personally really like the fusing bonding capabilities and the working time I get out of the plastic glue. This is something that you just kind of have to like figure out for yourself. If you're just starting though, and you are diving into Legion and you're gonna wind up with a mixture of hard plastic and soft plastic kits, my suggestion would be to just get good super glue and then stick with that for a while. And then you can move into this depending on how, which units you're getting, how much hard plastic you're working with. But this, this bottle here, this will take you through everything. So if you only want to get one, and again, you know, diving into any hobby can be kind of intimidating because there's so many things you think you have to get. This is it. So at the end of the day, if you get these three items, the clippers, a good hobby knife, and some super glue, you're, you're set to go. You're locked in. You have everything you need to move on to the next step. Um, now, the thing with these glues is that they do have an applicator tip. So when you take this off, you know, you can squeeze the glue out. Um, you can shake it out. It's semi-controlled. And again, there's like a billion different brands. So this is a gel super glue. They have like thin super glues. They have thick super glues, all this stuff, right? Um, there's a whole ton of different options when it comes to this. It doesn't really matter. Again, this is kind of what it works. I like the gel because I don't want the super glue to run because fun fact, super glue um, was initially intended to heal battlefield wounds really quickly and bond skin. So it does that extremely well. Um, so you do have to be really careful when you're using super glue to not get it on your fingers because your fingers will stick together. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can solve that. But the gel obviously doesn't run. So I like the thicker super glue, whereas I like the thinner cement. Again, these are just my opinions. Um, find what works best for you. But I found that to be best practice. When it comes time to actually apply super glue, what I like to do is grab a container. Um, some kind of non-porous plastic usually works really well. You could use ceramic for this or whatever. And instead of actually taking the super glue and applying it directly to the piece, which doesn't give you very much control, what I like to do is put a dab of the super glue. And now we have to like see if this bottle's full. There we go. So you put a dab, a nice little dab of super glue here, and then you use an applicator tip. So the best way to do this is typically with a toothpick, which of course I don't have because I'm not planning on using the super glue today. So failure there. Um, you can also use an extra piece of plastic if you want to. So like I can grab, for whatever reason, I have a toothpick. I can grab this little bit of plastic frame. What that allows me to do is put the super glue on where I want it. And then I can very easily apply it directly to the parts I want. And I know it's not going to run. And I know I have very, very good control with it. So again, toothpicks are great for this. You can use excess plastic frames, all that stuff. Um, nails, as the chat is talking about as well. Anything that gives you nice control. Um, and that isn't going to necessarily bond immediately with the super glue. So this is a really strong recommendation I have, no matter what super glue you're using. 
Um, if you're using a plastic cement that doesn't have an applicator that comes with it, for example, you're using a thicker plastic glue that comes out of a tube, same suggestion here. Have a non-pore surface that you can put uh, a nice little pile of that glue on and then use an applicator like, um, like a toothpick to apply that glue. And that's gonna save you a huge amount of mess, it's gonna save you a huge amount of frustration, and it's gonna give you the utmost control that you can possibly have. Uh, so that, that kind of covers our glue. So let's talk a little bit about the assembly process. Um, the, first, the first big tip that I think really benefits people as they're building these is you want to make sure that you're doing it over a surface that is kind of soft because if you drop a piece and you drop it on a hard table which I have here because I'm obviously not practicing what I preach um, due to the camera setup these these little plastic bits will bounce and they will bounce way farther than you expect so a really great practice uh, is to take like a cardboard lid uh, of some type that has like a nice wall Put a dish towel or a full towel inside of it that's kind of fuzzy, a nice soft one. And then when you drop the piece, not only will the towel absorb the impact of that hitting the surface and cause it not to bounce, uh, even if it does bounce, having it within that kind of walled box, that, that box lid, will stop it from bouncing out of the lid. Um, and so this prevents things like sneezing and watching the thing go flying across the room and go down the air vents. You know, if you fat fingered and you drop something, you can easily find it. It also stops you from losing the parts if you get a little too ambitious and you start clipping everything off all at once, which is something we're gonna talk about next is how to approach this stuff. So you definitely wanna make sure that you have a nice workstation um, that is set up when you're assembling to make sure that you have the lowest amount of frustration possible. So box lid, soft towel, that will make sure that you don't lose these parts even if you kind of flub and drop. And it's gonna happen. I've been doing this again for almost 30 years or over 30 years now. I don't really want to count, um, and I have certainly, I've certainly dropped pieces and lost them on the floor and had to do a little scrounging even in the last week. Um, so it's always good practice, especially when you're starting to just take that extra time, get a towel, set it up. Another tip that you can do if you're really, really concerned about dropping something is you can also put a towel on your lap. And so by putting a towel on your lap, it will catch the part and it won't go between your legs, which is typically in my experience where the parts really like to jump. They like to jump into your lap and then you're like, oh no, and then you have to like squeeze your legs really tight, but it's not there. Then you have to find it, you open your legs, it drops again and it falls. And it's very like, it's very British humor comedy um, as you try to like fix your, your little flub with your parts. So a towel on your lap will also really solve that problem. All right, so next up, what are we gonna do? So we have our frame, we have our tools. Um, there are instructions that are both on the Atomic Mass Games website for all of our um, miniature, uh, miniature products. And then, of course, there are instructions that typically come with every product as well. Um, so what you're going to want to do is you're going to review those instructions. Uh, the online ones typically are um, the best resource for you because they often take into account changes that happen in production. And a really quick, um, when we create miniatures instructions, just to kind of make this clear, we're doing so at a time when production is happening concurrently. So there are certain things that can shift based on um, the, fin the final production molds and tooling and stuff, um, or just simply having the actual miniature in hand. Um, that's why we have two different versions of those instructions and why we always say the one on the website is most up to date. So if you run into an issue with the printed instructions, it's best to check out the ones on the website because they might take into account something that was not there or apparently uh, present to our, to our knowledge when we made the printed instructions. So that is just one of the ways, one of the things to keep in mind. Always have the instructions with you and then follow them um, accordingly. Looking at my instructions for this Craven the Hunter, I now know what I want to start with. Um, we're going to start with the torso. So if we look here, you'll notice that there are numbers on each of the bits. The instructions um, online will always have the numbers with the bits. Um, so if you need that extra bit of assistance, that's where to go. When you want to start clipping these pieces off, the first bit of advice that I give is a lot of people, and I still see it, and I still do it sometimes to this day when I get really excited, is they'll clip everything off the frame and kind of set it in front of them uh, like a building brick set. You don't want to do that. 
Um, the frame, especially on hard plastic, is what's going to allow you to have that organization that you normally want. You know, if I drop the frame, those parts aren't gonna go anywhere. I can't lose a bit, like this spear cannot escape while it is stuck to its injection ports, um, no matter how hard I push on it or how hard I drop the frame. So don't, don't take all these, all these parts off before you need them, okay? Um, that again is gonna reduce your frustration. It's gonna make you more successful in the end. Uh, and it's a really important step that even if you're like, I know exactly what I'm doing, I'm just gonna clip them off because I'm in a hurry. Eventually you're gonna, you're gonna pay the price and you're gonna lose a piece. So you're gonna like, you know, just have your pile there and your arm's gonna brush it. You're not even gonna notice and you're, that piece is gonna be gone. And you're gonna spend the next 30 minutes looking for it. So I've identified the two pieces that I want. Um, I'm gonna grab my clippers. So this is how I'm gonna remove things from the frame. Don't use the knife. Um, the reason being you don't have enough control and the way in which the knife will bite into the plastic typically means that you will lose or cut into detail or you'll leave a really big like nub. Um, and it's gonna be harder to clean and you might wind up losing some detail. So while this will separate the plastic, it's not the best tool. And that's why I say the two, the two tools you have to have are the clippers and you have to have the hobby knife. Um, the other part to it is that don't break, don't break it off the, the frame with your fingers like this. I know this is satisfying to like work it off, but again, this can cause tearing on the plastic, which will cause you to lose detail or create big craters in it. It'll also, um, it can denature smaller parts. So like obviously down here uh, with this um, cool spear for Craven, if I tried to do that with this, um, this plastic is stiff. It's not gonna break very easily, but of course, as you work things back and forth, not only are you weakening the structure here, you potentially are weakening the structure along the length of the blade where it's, um, where it's weakest. So it's not, a, it's not a good idea. You just shouldn't do it. Um, always take your clippers, and you're gonna notice that there's a flat of the clipper, and there's kind of like a curve of the clipper. So you can see there how the clippers curve down. When you cut the part off the frame, you want the flat to be flat against the part, okay? So if I'm gonna cut this torso off, I don't want the clippers to, I don't wanna come into the clippers like this. I don't want the curve here. And the reason being is that the flat is gonna give me the cleanest cut. So while this won't really cause you any problems necessarily, like you'll probably get the part off fine, you're gonna have more cleaning to do with the knife and it's gonna be a little, a little more difficult with that. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna come in and I'm just gonna clip there and then I'm gonna support the piece with my fingers as I come in for the other piece because this is the part that's gonna release it. And then the part is gonna be loose and I'm gonna set the part down. I'm gonna to move to my next part, which is the back of the torso. I'm gonna do the same thing. So I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna clip. I'm gonna come over and I'm gonna clip. And I'm gonna put the part down. <clears throat> so I now have my two pieces. I've left everything else on the frame so I don't have to worry about losing them. Um, I can just focus on assembling these two. The first thing that you should do is dry fit. So what does that mean? It simply means taking the two parts and figuring out how they go together without glue. Uh, and this is important because on certain parts, that lineup might not be as prevalent um, or as clean as say these two torso halves. It's pretty easy to figure out like where these go, but even then there's a little bit of wiggle room. So I might be like, oh, maybe it goes like, you can see how these keys are really big, but in a different situation, I might be like, okay, well that that's not working. Well, now if I've put glue on this, I'm in trouble, right? Because I have to break it apart. Um, if I'm using plastic glue, I've already denatured the plastic. So as I pull it apart, it'll get really stringy and gross um, because it wants to fuse together and it's already melted. If I'm using super glue, it'll probably bond by this point. So now I have to like go through the process of breaking it apart, which may put stress on places that I don't want. So again, what I need to do here is I need to dry fit. So now that I've dry fit my pieces together and I know how they go, I can move in confidently with my glue. I'm gonna go ahead and use some plastic glue for this. Um, so I'm gonna grab my applicator tip. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of very quickly run that tip over. And you can see hopefully how that glue just goes into all these little cracks and crevices as I touch it to the, to the miniature part. So I don't have to like get in there and like paint it on and everything. Um, you don't have to typically put glue on both halves, although you can. Uh, that's kind of a personal preference option. I typically only do one side of the glue. Um, and then we're gonna take this and we're just gonna push and we're gonna give it a nice little firm push for about 
five to ten seconds depending on the piece and then at that point we're complete um, you can see that everything's really great it's all together our our lines on our seams are really nicely laid up um, so we're really good to go now one of the things you can do uh, with either glue but especially this thin plastic glue as you'll see here we have a little bit of a seam line where the two halves meet right at his torso um, Filling those is kind of beyond the Hobby 101 in most respects, but I'm gonna show you a really quick trip that's super easy um, to accomplish and that will help obscure any kind of seam line that happens from the natural like molding process of the miniature. And what I like to do is, you again, you just simply take some of your thin plastic glue and just run a little bit into that crack. And again, this will run into the crack um, of the miniature. And so already, you can kind of see how we filled up that seam and that plastic is denaturing together and it's filling. And as that glue dries, it's also going to dry smooth. So you've now filled that little crevice with a thin layer of glue. And what you can do after that is you can come back through after it dries and you need to make sure that it dries if you're gonna do this part. And you can take your hobby knife and you can kind of like smooth it down with a little scraping action that we'll show here in a second. Um, so that is something that you can do if you have a if you have a minor seam and you want to fill it. As a Hobby 101, it's very easy to do. Uh, it takes no additional materials or equipment. You just have to be very aware of where you're putting that glue. And then if you're going to do that, you need to put the part aside and let it really dry because if you stick your finger in that, you're going to either leave a fingerprint or you're going to adhere your finger to the thing. You can do this with super glue as well. Um, you would just simply put that in there and uh, you can absolutely um, do the exact same technique with super glue. It's less about denaturing the plastic and making it stick together and more about filling the gap and then coming back through and sanding it down. So depending on your feelings on like where the seam is and stuff, like this one probably won't even be noticeable once we finish the assembly. Um, but I just wanted to show you that as an option that you can do. Uh, for the most part though, you're going to notice that all of the miniatures have their seams very well hidden or they've been like engineered into being like um, seam lines on clothing and costumes and stuff like that. So they're there on purpose and we've cut them in that way. We're going to continue that process over and over again um, until we finish the miniature. I'm going to show you one more important thing. So what do we need the hobby knife for? Um, and that's a great that's a great wonderment person who's not here to ask. I'm going to show you next. So as we go through our process, one we're going to get extra little bits um, of plastic from our injection point when we clip off the frame. So we do want to go in and we want to make sure to clean those off. So how do you want to clean those off? The best way to do it is take your hobby knife and take the part. Brace the part in your off hand against your finger. Be aware of where your finger is compared to the knife. Um, take the knife in your hand, hold it pretty close to the blade, put your thumb against the flat of the blade. Okay, This is going to give you a lot of control over your movement. Uh, I'm going to try to do this so that you can see what's going on next with the camera. Place the blade right next to the part and then just simply scrape over where you want that clean to happen. Um, it's really important to note that as I scrape I'm doing an upward motion like this. So if I don't even have the part there I'm doing this. Now the reason I'm doing that is because if I go down I'm gonna dig into the part and while this is on the inside of Craven once he's assembled because this is gonna plug into his waist and you're not gonna see it if you happen to have, like, let's say, uh, the connection point is here for production reasons, if you dig in and you pull up, you're going to take a big gouge out of his leg. So you definitely don't want to do that. So again, the best, the best way to do it on a big piece is to make sure you're always scraping up. Now, um, in addition to cleaning off the injection port parts, which can be really important, um, there's also the question of um, what are called mold lines or flash. So to give you kind of an idea if you don't know how the process works, you should stick around for the next panel, which is going to be our creative director and sculpting director talking about exactly how they go through this project or the process of actually creating these miniatures in plastic. Uh, but they're molded, so it's two halves. So what happens is, is you have a top half of the mold, you have a bottom half of the mold. The molds come together and they do this. They get filled with plastic. The plastic cools, it pops up. You have yourself a final frame or a part. Um, so what will happen is there might be a little bit of excess material 
along the seam. So this leg was set up like this. That means that there's a possibility that there might be a little bit of excess plastic along the front and the back of the leg because of where those two halves of the molds come together. It's typically not a lot and it's almost not noticeable, but if you can kind of see there's a little bit of a line running right along here where a little extra material is there. So if I don't want that there, I can go ahead and I can do um, a clean. And the way that you clean with this is you're gonna take the knife and you're simply gonna gently scrape it almost with no pressure. It's two hairs and some air as a very famous um, painter Bob Ross once used to say about you know how you made clouds and stuff. Two hairs and some air, you're just gonna like really gently let the knife run over the plastic. And it's just gonna take off that top layer really quick. So you can do it that way. Another way that you can do it um, is if you're a little worried about your blade, your blade's really sharp or you're worried about the pressure, the plastic, the amount of plastic that you're taking off is actually so small that you can use the back of the blade, which has no sharpness. So you can simply use the flat of the blade on the back and it will absolutely take that right off and you won't even have to worry about like ham fisting it and cutting in to the part or pushing in. Um, there's really no way you can cut at the back of the blade and this will take you right off. So. And um, as people are pointing out, I'm pulling towards myself, although there's no real way to go around it. Um, so even if I was going this way, the other benefit that this has is that, of course, the sharp end of the knife is not near my finger, so I can't cut myself with the flat of the blade. Um, so this is also a really safe way to scrape and clean as opposed to doing it this way. Um, but if you're going this way or this way and your fingers are there because you're holding the part, as long as you keep that blade straight down and pay attention to what you're doing, again, this is a this is a very like cognitive thing. We're gonna we're gonna zone in and we're gonna enjoy the hobby, um, and that will will help you clean the parts and get everything to where you want to go. So you're gonna continue that process over and over again until all of the pieces have been uh, taken off the frame, cleaned and assembled, and you're gonna end up with a completed miniature, which is gonna look almost like this. Um, now, the difference, as you can see, between our incomplete Craven and our completed Craven is that this Craven has paint on him already. Um, so what is that? What is, what is the next step? The next step, uh, which is a very important step and one that you'll learn over the course of time um, as you move into your hobby journey, is that you need to prime the miniature. So. Um, effectively what we need to do in order to make sure that our that our painting process goes really really smoothly is that we want to ensure that we have a nice consistent layer of primer on the miniature which is going to allow our paints to adhere better they're going to have a better consistency and we're going to have kind of a consistent undercoat uh, for those paints to stick to so you don't have to do this if you really don't want to you can you can paint without a primer layer, but it's gonna make everything that we do next a lot harder. So um, what you use for primer, uh, sandable automotive primer is perfect. Um, there are of course a ton of hobby primers as well that you can get from different companies and brands and all that. But at the end of the day, if you get some good sandable automotive primer, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna wind up with great results. Uh, you can also get brush on primer. So if you don't wanna deal with like a rattle can um, or an airbrush, um, which of course is well beyond a 101. So we're really talking about rattle can priming here. Um, you can of course use brush on primer. You can even use just flat black or flat gray or flat white acrylics if you want to as a brush on primer. Um, but they do make specific like brush on primers that you can get at any hobby store or art store, um, things like that. And you can use that instead. Um, so kind of depending on your area and where you live and what the weather's like and all that stuff, brush on might just be the way to go. Um, however, rattle cans work great. Uh, again, any automotive sandable primer is going gonna, is gonna to work perfectly. Uh, and then, of course, you also have the options to go into more specific hobby primers and all that stuff, depending on what you like. And it's going to be a bit of like what works best for you. Unfortunately, I can't really give you a specific, like this one works great all the time because um, your climate, where you are in the world, your elevation, all of that will impact how stuff works. So the best advice I can give you is start with something like an automotive sandable primer. Go out and spray it a little bit on a test piece of cardboard 
or if you happen to have the frame left over, this is a great this is a great use for this extra frame. You can go out, you can spray the frame, and you can see how it reacts. Um, and you're going to know before you put it on your super cool miniature that the paint is going to apply the way you want it to. It's not going to be chalky. It's not going to run. It's not going to pit all that stuff. So again, extra the excess frame or the extra bases um, that you have lying around or just bases in general. If you don't base your miniature first, you want to test some stuff out are awesome test pieces because they're just going to get tossed anyway or they're going to go into a box and maybe someday you'll need them or not. Um, so that's that's the step with primer. You want to make sure that you're doing very thin coats um, when you're doing the primer. So I obviously can't spray inside my house. My wife would kill me. Um, so we already have a pre-primed um, Craven. I skip this step. But as you as you take the can, if you imagine you have the can, what you want to do is have your miniature um, attach it to like a box or some kind of holder where you're you're not going to get spray paint on your hand if you care about that. Um, but typically like a shoe box lid or something like that will work really well. Go into a highly well ventilated area. Um, do recommend you know having a mask if you're going to do a lot of priming. If you can't get outside, again go to the brush on primer. Don't be doing the stuff in your house or in your garage or anything. You need to be able to go out and do it because um, rattle can stuff is is pretty nasty. Um, and you want to take all the precautions that are on the label with it. Um, but once you get out there and you're all safe, you're masked up, you're in you're in open ventilation, and you know you're ready to go. You have your miniature attached. You want to be about um, you want to be approximately 10 inches away is what I find works best. But again, this is going to vary. I've heard six to 12 inches. Sometimes I've heard people be like 18. I don't know how the paint hits that. Um, again, this is why you want to test. You want to find that right distance for the can and the nozzle and all that stuff. Uh, and then you just kind of want to come through. And instead of hitting the miniature directly on, so like spraying straight at it. Don't do that. What you want to do is you want to do really soft sweeps with the can. Um, so like left to right or right to left, whichever way you like it. And you're just going to go And what that'll do is it'll make sure that you have a very even coat. You won't over blast an area. Um, and it gives you a lot of control over the heaviness of the primer layer. It also allows the primer to dry with each pass because it's so light. Um, that you won't get pooling, you won't get runs, all that stuff. Just a little extra time is going to save you a lot of a lot of worry. Um, so again, you want to make sure that you're going left to right or right to left, either way. And you're just taking that and you're just and it's just like a really fast spray. Um, I know it. I know it's really satisfying to go in and just be like and just spray it like a garden hose, like you sprayed your siblings. Maybe um, I was the only one, right? Who used to go after my siblings with the garden hose and just like blast them full on until they were like crying. That never happened, totally. Uh, don't do that with your miniatures. Treat your miniatures better than you treated your siblings, I guess, or how I treated my siblings uh, in the end. Um, so really soft, gentle left to right sprays. Um, you're going to get really nice results. It's going to be really smooth. Obviously, we obscured none of the detail on this Craven uh, because we took that little extra time and made sure that was going on. We didn't get any runs or stuff like that. Uh, so that is priming. So once we have our primer layers down, we are ready and raring to go for painting. So 40 minutes into the stream and we're finally gonna start putting paint on miniatures. It's great. This is why the stream is two hours um, in length because we got a lot to cover and I wanna make sure that we're kind of covering everything that's important. So let's talk a little bit about what you need to be able to put paint on a miniature. The biggest thing are paints and a brush. So what do I need for brushes? Well. The simple answer is you can use pretty much anything that you like for brushes. So um, I have been doing this for a long time. Um, I have found that I really like Kalinsky Sable brushes. Um, these are watercolor brushes that utilize Kalinsky Sable. They're very nice brushes. Um, if you treat them nicely and you know are good to them, they will be good to you and they'll last for a long time. Um, do you need these? Absolutely not. I started using synthetic brushes. Um, you know, these each run about 20 to $30, which is, you know, kind of crazy uh, when you're first starting out and definitely not necessary. Um, they are very nice, but they are not required. So go to a hobby store, go to an art store, look for some nice synthetic brushes or some nice brush packs. There are also natural bristles that are not Kalinsky Sable. There's a lot of different options out there. I'll tell you the two primary things, the most important things when you're picking out your brushes for the first time that you want to pay attention to. Because if you have these two things in your brush, you're going to be able to do all the processes that we show with, with a lot of success, and it's going to be fine. The two most important things when looking at a brush 
are the belly and the tip, okay? So you can see here how these fatter brushes have a really nice belly. And what that means is, is that they're really thick and then they taper down to a nice point. The belly's important because the belly is gonna allow the brush to hold more paint. The more paint a brush holds, the longer it will take that paint to dry, which means that you're gonna be able to paint a lot longer and your paint is gonna go on a lot smoother because it's gonna remain fluid and it's gonna flow well and it's gonna go on smoothly and nicely and you're gonna be able to get really good results. Um, it can be really, really uh, enticing for folks to be like, well, I don't have a lot of brush control, so I'm gonna go with something really, really tiny. I mean, this is not even that small in in the hobby, like tiny brush world, like triple zeros, you know, all that stuff where it's like two hairs, it seems of bristles. That's great because, you know, you do have a really fine point, but the problem is, is that the second you take that brush out of your paint, the paint is dried because there's no, there's no paint there. So the, the surface area is just so minimal that it dries immediately and you can't get any paint off the brush. So then you struggle a lot and you wind up either having to thin your paints down way too much or you get really chalky results. Um, so the, the size of the brush, you actually want something with a really nice belly. Um, you, want, you want the ability to hold a lot of paint. Now, where does the control come from? Well, the control doesn't come from the size of the belly. The control comes from the size of the point. So if you get brushes that go to a nice point, like these ones do, and a lot of brushes will do this um, if you take care of them, including synthetic brushes, your paint is going to sit here. It's going to stay fluid. It's going to stay wet. And then it's going to run to the, to the tip of the brush. And the tip of the brush is going to control it through capillary action and all that. So as long as you have a nice point, you can have really good control. Um, I like these brushes, I like these smaller brushes I use for tighter areas where I think the belly might touch the miniature and I'm going to get paint everywhere. But honestly, I can do just as much detail work. I can do, you know, tight eyeballs and lining and all of that. I can do that almost better with the bigger brushes than I can with the smaller brushes because typically when you're doing that stuff, you need the paint to be very fluid and it needs to flow really well, which means that it needs to be very wet. It can't dry out. Um, so... Uh, these brushes can cause problems because by the time you get to the, the little point of the miniature, your paint is drier, which means it doesn't apply as well. Um, so these are really used for tight spots where I might not be able to get the fatter belly of a brush in. So under an arm or something like that. Um, or if I'm using like an ink and I want to kind of draw, this can be a little more useful too, depending on the fluidity of the paint. So again, the only two things, because I can't tell you what brush is going to work best for you. It's going to be personal preference. I've never had a consistent answer from anybody um, on what brush they think is the penultimate brush or the ultimate brush, um, whether number one or number two, depending on, on what you want. The two most important aspects are belly and point. So find something that has a good belly, find something that has a good point, and then just work with it and go slowly. Again, if you're just starting out, the techniques we're going to talk about are going to work absolutely great um, with any kind of brush at all as long as it has those two things so that is my rant on what kind of brushes you need what kind of paint do you need well you can use any kind of paint um however because uh you know you're going to be moving forward into this larger world of hobby and we have these really nice miniatures um, it's always best to find a really nice hobby paint um, one that you're going to like the colors of that's going to work. There's a ton of artist colors um, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. For Hobby 101, we're going to stick to kind of what is the most accessible and the easiest to work with, which is um, acrylic colors. So there is a ton of different brands and manufacturers of acrylic. There are hobby ones. Um, you know, there's ones you can find in the art store like Golden High Fluid. There's Scale Color. There's Vallejo. There's a million different options. Um, Talk to people, try out a, a couple of different ones. They all have their own properties, but in the end, they're all kind of the same thing. They're just acrylic pigments with you know some binder in them and some extender and stuff like that. Um, uh, we use the scale colors and a little bit of Vallejo all the time on our streams. I find they work really well. They have a wide range of colors. Um, so you can kind of find anything you want to your heart's content. Um, they come in these little dropper bottles, which make it a little easier as well to get the paint out. But at the end of the day, um, acrylics are going to be your best friend. Don't go for like the bottom end acrylics. You can make those work. But the problem with those is that the pigments that are used in the paints are typically chunkier. So we're working with really fine detail. 
um, we have you know a 40 millimeter canvas or even smaller in the case of what I'm going to paint next uh, having really thick pigments is going to potentially affect the overall detail you're going to be able to get out of the paints so hobby miniature paints or high-end acrylic paints have a really fine pigment it's no different than any other paint and this is what makes the price difference um, largely is the is the the fineness of the pigment in there which also increases the quality and like the smoothness of them so do go for a good hobby paint um, you know and again there's lots of different types the ones that I've mentioned are the ones that we like to use explore um, I will tell you that you should never limit yourself to simply one brand or one line uh, I have utilized a mixture of everything over the time you'll find different colors that work for different things it's kind of like saying well I only use salt, pepper, and paprika for all of my cooking. Well, that's silly. Like, go out, grab some garam masala, grab some curry powder, grab some, um, grab some nutmeg, some okra. Like, grab all the stuff, right? Make that spice cabinet, make that painting cabinet uh, as wide as you want it to be to achieve the results you want. Now, of course, that's over the amount of time. So let's talk. Let's talk about. Um, you just started again. I'm not trying, I'm not here to even tell you that, oh, well, you know, you better go out and you better buy that big old 220 set paint thing because you're going to need all those colors to paint. You're not. Um, over time, you're probably going to want that many colors. You know, you're going to want something that looks like this that I can't even get on camera, you know, where we have like all the colors of the rainbow. Ooh, it's so fancy, right? Um, that That is something that, you know, maybe a year in or something that you'll you'll potentially want as you have explored and, and begun to really master these different skills and things like that. Um, there's also a very real possibility that you don't. And what it comes down to is it comes down to convenience and it comes down to your painting style. So at the end of the day, the most important colors that you need are kind of the, the primary 12 colors. Um, and what those are can be a little different depending on what you're painting. But what I find um, and I'm going to give these all to you in scale color, but I'm not going to pull them all out because I, I failed on that. Um, but these are these are the colors that if I look at the paints that I have, and I have a huge range, I have three of those trays of different colored paints that I just showed that are all different types. Um, if I really go through and look at the ones that I've actually opened, which, oh, this one I did open. Let's find one that I haven't opened yet, and I've had this forever. I think this one's not open. Yeah, I haven't even opened this one yet, and I've had these paints for almost a year now um, like uh, in reality you're gonna find the colors that work well with what you want to do and the colors that you want to go to and then those other colors that you have are nice to have when you need them but they're they're only gonna get used every once in a while you know if you don't do a lot of Indian cooking having curry powder in your spice cabinet might not be used all that time but when you want to do that that cuisine it might be really important to you um, so what are the 12 colors that I really recommend in terms of like the ones that I use the most, the ones that other people I've talked to in the studio have used the most, and the ones that are gonna let you mix and match colors that you don't need. You need a flat white, you need a flat black. Those are really important. So white and black, like no specialness to them. Those are gonna allow you to, to increase or decrease saturations. They're gonna allow you to um, do a lot with contrast. They're gonna allow you to like really work with them. Um, Abyssal blue is an incredible blue black. Um, I use this one all the time. It is an amazing way to get really nice looking blacks because as we'll talk about a little bit, when you're painting black, you're actually just painting highlights. Um, so black is not really black. It's just successive layers of other colored highlights that lead into the deepest rec recesses, which are black. And I really like blue black. So Abyssal Blue to me is a fantastic way to get really great looking natural blacks with not a lot of effort because it has this nice little blue tinge to it. And it plays well with a lot of the other colors that I have in there. Um, the next color, which people are screaming about in the chat, and they're totally right, if I can find it here. Oh, there it is. Is Hold Your Blue. Hold Your Blue is a color that we use all the time. Um, it is kind of this interesting little blue-green. It looks really dark in the bottle, but when you take it out of the pot, um, it has this really interesting kind of like blue-greenness to it. It's super rich. Uh, you can thin this thing down, and I'm going to put a little bit on my nail here so you can kind of see the color. Um, so you can see how it just has this really cool, it's super dark, you can thin it out really nice, it has this really nice like blue base to it, there's a little bit of green in there. Um, it's an incredible color, so I definitely, I definitely say that that is one of the ones that you want to have as well. 
Um, it plays really well with Mayhem Red, so this kind of fills in the red spot. Uh, so if you're not looking at scale colors, and instead just looking at colors, you need white, black. I would recommend a very nice blue-black. Um, get a really good like deep blue, like a, like a cyan, right? If we're starting to talk about print colors, cyan. Um, find yourself a good red. Mayhem Red is kind of on that magenta scale. It's not quite a pure red. Um, it's, it's got a little bit of that cyan, uh, or that magenta, excuse me, not cyan, magenta color in it, which means it plays well with our Halder Blue Cyan. So you're looking for like a magenta, um, brown leather. You're gonna be, you can mix up your browns, but uh, that's a pain in the butt. Brown leather is a really nice neutral leather. So if you're gonna paint a lot of pouches, if you're gonna paint a lot of stuff, um, the brown brown leather, something that kind of looks like this color here, which this one is literally called brown leather. Uh, this is kind of like a burnt sienna or a burnt umber. Actually, it's probably closer to a burnt umber in the end. Um, that is going to be super useful to you. You can also use this for shading, for mixing, all that stuff. Uh, Thar Brown is the next one from Scale. And again, I'm just using Scales, but you can find these colors anywhere. Thar Brown is a really great um, eggshell white. So it's got a lot of yellow to it. So this is going to play well with mixing with our brown, with our umbers and all that stuff. Um, it's also super great for doing things like bone, nails, teeth, uh, khaki colors. This color is going to get utilized a lot. And instead of and actually, it's going to get utilized a lot for mixing into highlighting for the other colors. Because one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit is you almost never want to mix in flat black or flat white for your highlights because it's really going to dull them down. Um, and there are times where you want to do that. But if you want to maintain vibrancy, which let's be honest, um, you know, Marvel it has a lot of vibrancy. Star Wars has a lot of vibrancy. Um, you want to use colors that are off, off colors. So an off white of some type, either a yellow or a blue off white. That brings me to my next color, which is another one that I super love, which is our blue white, which is Arctic blue. So I'm going to use this to highlight all of, with my all of my blues, my holders, all this stuff. Um, this color I use all the time. It is fantastic as a base for painting pure white because unlike black, which is all about painting highlights, white is all about painting shadows. Arctic blue is the highlight color that's going to take us there. Um, so a blue white is really great. From there, you definitely want kind of a nice green color, um, like a solid kind of uh, overall green, like the color that I can't find right now. Here we go. Arati green is a really nice kind of brighter green that you can play with. If you don't want something quite so bright, you're looking for something a little more natural or neutral, you can go with a more blue, like a boreal green. Um, but find yourself a really good green. Uh, you want a good ochre, so a very nice yellow ochre color like either Sahara yellow or Iroko. Um, you can see this one has a little bit more yellow in it. This one's a little more desaturated. Uh, these colors again are going to be really good for mixing into your brown color to make different effects for brown. They work with that Thar brown really well for like highlights for bone, teeth, and all that. So yellow ochre. This is also going to be your base for painting true yellow um, because trying to paint pure yellow out of a pot is really, really difficult. Uh, that said, you still do want a true yellow. Um, so my suggestion is something like a primary yellow. Madruk is a really great primary. This is going to work, play really nicely with those ochres that we just showed. Um, so you're going to use the ochre. You're going to mix in the yellows successively to create highlights until you get a pure yellow, because pure yellows are not actually pure. Really important as well. Um, so a pure yellow, primary yellow is, is really important. The last two colors, these are a little bit of my personal preference. I love painting purples. So violet, a good violet color is amazing. You can mix this with your, like you could mix this with your Mayhem um, red and your Holder blue, for example, your blue, your, your cyan, your magenta. You can make those uh, into purple. So you can just work with the three primaries and mix everything you want. Um, again, these 12 colors give you a little bit more range and they allow you to mix together to make pretty much everything else. Um, so again, 12 colors was kind of the, that it's a very, I think, reasonable hobby jump into what colors do I need. The last one, and this one again is kind of personal preference, but I find it works really well, is fuchsia. So this is a true, this is a pretty true magenta color. Um, so if you have your cyan, uh, your magenta and your yellow, you have your CMYK for those out there who love printing or art. Um, CMYK is what everything else is derived from. So you can make every color from it if you want to get really artsy. Uh, this is a really great magenta color, but uh, of course, every every brand has its own magenta, so find the one that you like that works best for you. So those are the 12 colors. That's all you need. You're ready to go. Uh, we've talked about everything at this point. Let's go ahead and start painting.
we're gonna paint we're gonna paint a Yoda uh, I had something different I painted a Yoda last night on our hobby hang stream had so much fun with it thought he'd be such a great example that uh, it was time to to do him again um, so we have our paints we're ready to go uh, the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with a base coat so the most basic kind of um, the most useful let's not call it basic the most useful three skills that you will ever learn that are kind of the foundation for everything else that you'll do is base coat, wash, highlight. Those three steps. If you can, if you can practice those three steps and you can get comfortable with those three steps, you can pretty much do anything. You can conquer the world at that point. Um, these are the fundamentals uh, and, and they're so important and they're so easy really to master with a little bit of practice that once you have these three down, you can then start playing with all kinds of things. And we're gonna introduce a couple of other techniques that play really well with them and that offer some different options. But base coat, wash, highlight uh, is a very powerful trifecta to get your miniatures painted and looking really good. So let's start with base coating. All base coating means is you're gonna take an area and you're gonna lay down a solid foundation of your base layer. So what are you gonna use for your base layer? Uh, it depends on what you're attempting, but in this specific instance, I wanna paint this cloak in kind of a tan, like lighter cad key color. So I'm gonna start with Thar Brown. This is gonna be my base layer. You want your base layer to be your mid-tone. So what's a mid-tone? That's a fancy way of saying like, if there were no light, if there were no lights or shadows, that's the flat color of the thing. So we can assume that in some weird, like flat, no, no light, no highlight, no shade world, that coat is this color. This is the true color of the coat. It is its platonic ideal of color. Now we're just getting silly. It's been three days. Stick with me, folks. Um, so what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna take my color and I lied. There's one more tool that you probably need, although it doesn't have to be this. You need a palette. So you need something to put the paint on. Um, you can get these well palettes from art stores super cheap. You can use a piece of bathroom tile if you have some porcelain. Uh, you can use a non-porous plate, not a paper plate, something like, you know, um, a dinner plate, like a plastic plate or a ceramic plate. Um, you can use an aluminum one. You can do, you can get a wet palette if you really want to go crazy, but we're not there. This is Hobby 101. You don't need a wet palette for what we're doing. Um, you, but you need some place to put the paint down. So we're just going to take our paint pot. We're going to put out some paint. Um, never be afraid of putting out too much paint, you know? You kind of want a little more than what you want. Uh, why shouldn't you use a paper plate? You can use a paper plate, but paper plates are absorbent, so they're gonna absorb your glue. So if you use a piece of cardboard or like something porous, your paint's gonna disappear, it's gonna suck all the wetness out, and it's gonna dry really fast. So this is non-porous. Not only is it easy to clean because the acrylics will tear right off of it because there's nothing for them to adhere to, it also allows you to maintain wetness in your paint. So. That's why you don't want to use porous materials like paper or anything like that for those who are asking. You can in a pinch, I don't recommend it. Um, just grab a piece, you can also, again, you can go back to like a little Tupperware container. This lid will work perfectly fine um, for that as well. You know, anything that's not porous is gonna, is gonna work really great for you. Uh, so we have our base color. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loosen the paint a little bit. So what this means is I'm gonna go to my water cup and I'm gonna just add a couple drops of water into my paint. And the reason that I'm doing this is so that the paint will flow nice and they'll have a nice smooth consistency that will come out. Um, there's no, I'm, I'm afraid, there's a lot of people who are like, skim milk, it's supposed to be like skim milk. One, who drinks skim milk? And two, it's kind of meaningless, you know, like what does that mean? Um, the best advice that I can give you is just play with the paint a little bit and once you think it's running smoothly off the brush, um, you're ready to go. Now, if you overwater it down, you know, you wanna do this carefully and slowly in stages. If you do too much water, you're gonna get into a wash consistency, which we'll talk about next. Um, so you do wanna be a little bit careful. Every paint is gonna be radically different. Even the same color and the same line, based on how you agitated it, based on what the, the manufacturing batch looked like. That's why I say there's no, there's no simple solution for this. This is just a feel thing. It's like, how salty should your food be? That depends on your taste. So, um, so you just kind of want to practice and play with the paint a little bit. I will tell you, it's almost never going to be straight out of the pot. 
even if you just get your brush itself wet to prep the paint, you're gonna want some, mo some additional moisture in there to help the paint flow and be loose. Um, okay, so let's talk, about, let's talk about paint and the brush. So you can see here how far I went up the brush with the paint. Uh, this is really important. You don't want the paint to go up more than halfway up the belly of your brush. And the reason being is that, you know, paint and water will flow up the bristles, especially if they're natural bristles. So you have less to worry about a little bit with synthetics, but capillary action will still draw the paint up the brush. And if you mash your brush all the way in the paint to where it's like up to this ferrule right here, this is the piece that holds all the bristles together really nice. And paint gets inside the ferrule, it'll dry in there and it'll force the bristles apart. And so what you'll wind up with is you'll wind up with some sad, sad brush that looks like this. And we don't want our brushes to look like that because remember, the most important thing to us is a good point. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about dry brushing and stuff soon. Um, and this brush has now been promoted to a dry brush because this is actually great for dry brushing, but we don't want this most of the time for our brushes. So if you want to maintain your brushes, the best thing you can do for their health is to make sure that the paint is only going up half, half the brush and you're not getting paint in the bristles. This also means that if you're not using a dropper bottle or as you're mixing paints like I just did, it's best to take like a crappy brush that you don't really like as your mixing brush and then you can just like mash the paint in it and it doesn't matter because it's already ruined. Only use your good brushes for the actual painting. Uh, relegated as well is, is perfectly fine, promoted. Um, retired is kind of the way I look at it. Okay, so we've done all that. We're gonna get paint on our brush. I'm gonna move this palette out of the way. We're gonna apply our base coat. When you do a base coat, you're simply looking for a nice smooth application of paint over the surface of the miniature. So I'm simply gonna take my brush and I'm going to work fairly quickly because I have a lot of practice. You might go a little slower as you work on your brush control and that's okay. It's not a race, just take your time and enjoy the process. And we're just going to start layering a base layer over the top of the areas that we want to be this color, which in this case is Mr. Yoda's robe. Um, you can use a lot of different angles to get into the brush. You want to make sure that you're keeping your paint kind of smooth and thin, so you don't want to glop it on. You want to make sure that you're maintaining all of that detail. Two thin coats is probably going to get you a lot farther than one thick coat. So you notice I'm already going back over some of the areas that I did. Make sure those layers have dried first because I didn't have to put a lot of liquid into this paint. Um, in order to thin it out, it is gonna dry semi-quickly. And we're just gonna continue to make this base layer for the cloak as we move around. And this is the part where you just get to zone in and appreciate the process. Um, the biggest, probably my number one piece of advice is, you know, this is a hobby that you get to do. This is part of the joy of the entire experience. Playing the games is fun. I, I love, I love throwing down, you know, miniatures on a tabletop and getting in a game of uh, Legion with my fam currently because we're all in lockdown still or at the game store or whatever. It's, you know, that's, that is a reward into and of itself, but the thing that has kept me in the hobby for 30 years and the part that I have just really loved the most and seen people um, expand and grow on is the skills of the hobby, the painting, making your own collection, you know, making your own wolf pack clones and creating your own Yoda. I mean, this happened last night. When would you ever see pink GMGM GM Yoda ever? except in this game. And this came out of creativity and silliness and fun. Um, no one's ever gonna have a Yoda like that again. Like that is, that is unique to me. So this is the part where you're expressing your creativity, you're working your art, and you're building a skill that you're gonna improve consistently over time and practice. You're not gonna get it right the first time, you know, uh, but you did it, you know. Success is, is doing the thing and then doing it better the next time because you've learned. I learn something new every time I sit down to the paint table. And, you know, I'm blessed enough that with my job, I get to sit down at the paint table a lot now. So even over the last, you know, year and a half, my skills have improved dramatically as I've pushed myself and found new things. Um, 
the hobby is all about being comfortable with being uncomfortable because that's where joy is found. You know, that's where success and being um, improvement is, is gained, is being uncomfortable. Nobody ever gets better in a situation where they're not tested. Uh, when it comes to brush control, you know, just hold the brush like you would any kind of pencil. I like to hold it up close. You're making really smooth strokes. If you notice that the paint is kind of starting to dry on your brush and you're not getting smoothness, go back to your water well. Um, so I just have a mug of water. It's my dad cup. Uh, and clean out your brush and then grab some new paint and reapply. So it's a little bit of a dance with the paint. You want to make sure that everything is coming out smooth, that your paint is still flowing really nice. Um, a couple of thin coats are going to be way better than a thick coat, so don't rush it. Enjoy the process, get there, and here's our color. So that's our base coat for the cloak. We will do uh, the base coat for his pants, or his inner tunic, I guess. Um, so I'm going to use my brown leather for this. Again, same process, put a little bit of brown leather out onto the palette. Give it a little thin down, loosen it up just a little bit. Make sure that everything's working well. And then we're just going to come in and we're going to knock out the inside layer. And I would continue this for the skin, um, for the metals and the lightsaber, all that stuff. So there are a couple different approaches that you can take. You can completely finish an area first. So for example, um, you could base coat the coat or the, the outside robe. Then you could go back in and you could um, do the wash next. But because Yoda is a little bit of a small, a smaller guy and there's a lot less surface area, I'm just going to do the inside tunic really quick so that can have some time to dry um, when we go back and we do our wash. And again, we can do the exact same thing for the green on Yoda. Um, I'm going to use, we'll use this goblin flesh, I guess. Oh, that's really green. I don't want that one. Um, there we go. We'll use slimer green? Slimer green? That seems hard. Yeah, we'll use slimer green. Um, ah. Proper way to clean the brush. That's a great question that should be on my list. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, here's my cup of water. It's my dad mug. It's got a dad on it cool dad see that it's the way it works um, clean this was clean it's not clean anymore it's pretty grody take your brush that has paint on it put it in there give it a quick swirl until it's clean might take more and then um, there's a couple different what things you can do you can if you have a rag simply clean it on the paper towel but what I like to do to maintain the point is to drag and twist the brush just a little bit on a nice absorbent surface. So having a paint rag or a paper towel, I use, I'm gonna be honest, I don't have one because I use my jeans. <clears throat> I just use my pants. So my pants can often have um, paint colors on them. And uh, yes, it is the worst coffee ever if you, make, if you make a mistake. I have cleaned my brush in my coffee. So another pro tip for everyone who's getting started out there, um, make sure that you have really good separation between your coffee mugs or otherwise you're gonna you're gonna drink some coffee and that's not gonna be that's not gonna be awesome I'm gonna be honest it's not it's not the best taste in the world but thankfully acrylics you know um, it's not terrible okay so this is our base coat layer uh, I wanted to do a little bit of green on our Yoda just to kind of continue to show how the base coat stuff works um, again you know, we're not going to go through the whole Yoda here because we've got a lot more stuff to cover. But I kind of want to give you a sense of how this all works together, how it all plays together, what a base coated miniature looks like. All right. So we'll just call that good. I'm not going to worry about uh, the rest of him because I want to move on to the next step. But I think this gives the idea, you know, it gets the idea across. So you can. 100%, here's the Yoda I was working on last night, who's all base coated. You can call this good. Once you get to the base coat level and you have all of your solid foundations applied, you could be like, this is great. I think this is a wonderful tabletop miniature. Like, 
let yourself enjoy the success of this stage if you're just getting started, right? It looks awesome, it's got color, he's very dynamic. We need to finish the saber, but whatever. And we do the blade, but you can see his skin's done, his coat's done, his inner tunic is done, his belt is done. Like, he's good to go. So let's get a game in if that's what we wanna do next. Um, and this is a great way to start and begin to get comfortable with brush control and learning how to paint on the miniature. Going back to our base coats, let's go ahead and talk about the next stage, which is wash. So what a wash is, is a wash is designed to bring out detail within the miniature by adding shading. The biggest thing to keep in mind when painting miniatures is that, you know, these guys, especially this Yoda, are tiny, right? They have sculpted detail, they're three-dimensional. So they naturally pick up light and shadow like any three-dimensional miniature would. But because they're representing things that are much, much larger in reality, in miniature form, the eye has trouble reading things at this scale, right? It's just, it's small. And we see it from an arm's length away. We're not quite as close as I can get this camera, right? You're never really viewing the Yoda from this distance. Um, it's always a bit further away. It's always from that arm's length away. So, oops, a little too far out. Go back in there. Um, so part of the process of miniatures painting and, and the techniques behind it are all about helping the eye see what is already there. So it's over exaggerating the folds, the shadows, the highlights, so that the eye can immediately see what's going on at that scale. And we're cheating. It's a little bit of optical illusion. It's a little bit of help. We're assisting the miniature with what it already wants to do. And that's why I say a base coat, just getting the base coats down, you know, this Yoda has, he has volume. He has, he has natural shadows from the cloak and stuff, from the light plane on it. What we're gonna do with the wash specifically is we're going to accentuate, we're gonna over exaggerate the shadows of the miniature. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna provide contrast and it's gonna allow the volumes of the miniature, the volumes of these folds to become even more distinguished to the eye. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna use a wash. Now what a wash is, is it's not a specific type of paint. Washing is a technique. You can do it with anything. You can make any paint into a wash. The way you make a wash is simply by taking regular paint and adding an extender to it. At, at the very base, you just add water. Um, if, you, um, if you want to, you can add a flow improver. So there's a lot of different acrylic mediums out there, which are basically just the binder that they make paint out of. You can add more binder to it, which extends the pigments. Um, those are typically better than water, but they're an additional thing that you have to have. So for example, you know, there's a lot of these different like glazed mediums that can extend, you know, there's flow improver, there's all this stuff. Um, now for Hobby 101, my suggestion is that uh, go out and grab a nice like pre-made sepia wash, a nice black wash, a nice brown wash, a nice blue wash um, at most. And really you only really need like the brown and the black. Um, the sepia is really nice if you're going to do something like this cloak. I'm going to use a sepia wash on this cloak. Uh, lots of different paint companies make pre-made washes. The thing that I want to just make everyone aware of who's new is that something on a bottle that's named a wash is not special. It's just a thinned out paint. It's a technique, not a product. Um, and that's really important because if you understand that it's a technique and not a product, that means that you can make a wash out of anything. So if you don't want to go out and buy uh, an additional bottle of wash, we can actually take, say, um, our, our yellow ochre here. We could take our Oroco and we could thin this down into a wash and we could wash it over the cloak. Uh, and we could get a very similar result, if not a better result, because we're using a color that we're controlling. That said, for convenience and ease and success, um, having the ratio just right out of the bottle you know, like this, black wash, game wash, already right there, is well worth it. And it's well worth it for speed, especially when you're having to wash like a thousand different things or you're doing a whole army or something like that. So um, I highly recommend for people just getting into the hobby that you pick up a couple of different game washes. Again, a brown and a black, and then maybe a blue. Blue is a great wash for just about everything. Like blue is the, the bully color of the color world. It shades everything. Um, those will really help you out. 
uh, and they and they will make things go well. Now washes, you're just going to notice if I use my thumb again here. Um, you can see how the wash just kind of wants to pool in the crevices of my fingernail and it stretches itself kind of out over the thing. So it does tint, you know, there's a bit of transparency. It's very translucent because it's super thin. So it stretches itself over the entire area, but it really wants to pool in the cracks and you can actually see it as it runs down the natural striations of my fingernail. So when it comes to the miniature itself, like on this cape or this cloak, I keep wanting to call it a cape. It's not a cape, it's a cloak or whatever. Um, you can see as I apply it, how dramatically it shifts everything by adding that extreme contrast, that extreme shading, and it really wants to pull in all these nice folds and cracks. So you can see here how we've, we've altered our initial base color, if you compare it to the sleeve to here. We've tinted our color because the wash is stretching over everything, but where that wash really wants to live is it wants to live in those folds. It wants to live in those cracks and crevices. Um, you want to make sure that your wash doesn't pool excessively. So like for example, uh, this is a really stark effect where it's pooling like these big puddles here, but you may not want that. And so typically you don't. I will say typically you don't want that. You want this to be a little more subtle than that. Um, also as those puddles dry, they'll get really shiny and they'll kind of look goopy. Uh, so the way to solve that is don't go back to your well um, or to your, your little wash your wash well. Instead, continue to work the wash over the miniature, and then you can come back and with your brush that has less wash on it, you can pull the wash back with your damp but not loaded brush. And so you can get a lot of working time because they're super thin and they have a lot of extender in them. There's a lot of working time with inks um, and washes. So this kind of like technique, you, you get a lot of play time to go back and kind of play around, um, pull the color, pull up the puddles with a damper brush, make sure that the effect is looking just like you want. Um, if we wanted to, we could even just say, okay, we're just gonna wash all of the browns with this. So maybe we just want this consistent layer of color for ease and everything over, over all of our browns. Um, if you wanted to do a darker, a darker wash over the darker leathers, you could do that as well, or the darker, the darker browns. Um, the contrast is going to change based on what you use. If you use a black, it's going to be really extreme. Um, we could probably use a black wash on this brown if we wanted to, because it's pretty dark. I wouldn't suggest using a black wash over this really nice, like, kind of khaki cloak, though, um, because as you can see, it really tints the color. But you know, we can do that and we can finish this up. Now we have really nice contrast. We have extreme contrast between our shadows and our highlights. Uh, the, the sheen of it will die down as it dries. So like he's really, really glossy right now. Um, that will slowly go away as the wash dries. It's important to note though, it won't go away completely. So when you utilize pre-made washes or even your own washes, um, you're gonna get a bit of a satin finish. You're gonna get pretty shiny. The way in which you're gonna combat that, which we'll talk about at the end, is through a dull coat or a sealant. Um, and you can take the shine away. So one of the things I like to point out to, to people who are new to the hobby is that this shine, this artificial sheen, will make the miniature look less um, contrast, will make the miniature look less uh, volumetric, like all of the all of the work that you've done will not show as well when it's shiny because that reflection is hiding your work. So you can have a moment of panic where you're like, oh, I ruined it. Look how terrible it looks. Walk away from it for a little bit. Let it dry. Grab a hair dryer. Give it a quick blow um, with some hot air and let it let that sheen go away. And you're all of a sudden you're going to see a, a large difference um, in terms of the overall effect and the style and stuff. So don't panic right? This is a process. It takes a little bit of time and things are going to work as they go. Um, so, you know, don't, don't, don't lose your mind over stuff like that. Um, I am going to, uh, we're going to come back to this and we're going to go to the highlight, but because it's wet, we're going to, we're going to talk about a different process for highlighting because it's all kind of the same. Um, but you need to give this time to dry. And if you don't give it enough time to dry and you try to go back through, uh, you can actually pull the wash up and that will leave little bathtub ring puddles and it'll look really bad. Um, so you have to know the moment, it w like you have to just kind of like learn 
the tendency of the wash and its drying time. And then once you're happy with the result, leave it until it's completely dry. Um, you don't want to go back and try to re-pull wash. You don't want to try to go back and pull up puddles once it reaches that midpoint, because if you do, um, it's not going to play well with you. It's, it's going to mess it up. So it's best to just leave it and fix it later um, or just leave it and be happy with it. Now, at this point, again, if you go through the wash stage and you're like, yep, seems great. I'm super happy with this. Like you can already see on the pants how much nicer those look with the wash now that we have really deep shadows in the creases and we have that like really nice stretch over the knee. We have this natural highlighting here. A lot of people just do base coat and wash and they leave it alone. Um, you know, and as that gloss like dies away, as it dries, he's gonna look really nice and it's gonna be perfectly fine. So you can stop here as well. Just like if you can stop with base coating, you can go back, you can do the washes and you can stop the next time. And the really awesome thing about this three steps and the reason that it's so great for, for new players or for people who are new to the hobby is that you can do it in stages. You can base coat everything. And then when you're comfortable enough with your brush control and your base coating, you can go back to all the miniatures that you base coated and do the wash. And then once you're comfortable with the wash and you're ready to go to this next, the next step, which is the highlight stage, you can do that as well. Um, and so you can build off of all of this stuff uh, progressively as you gain confidence, as you gain skill. Or you can just dive in and do all three of the steps right away and aim for you know, that three-stage result. So we're going to put him to the side. I'm going to pull out uh, another miniature here. So this is a Wookiee, uh, one of the new Wookiee warriors that's going to be releasing for Legion. Um, I like to call him Dreadlock Wookie. I don't know his actual name. But uh, for those asking in the chat, yeah, I would wash I would wash Yoda's head normally with like uh, a green wash, but I we only have 20 some minutes left and there's a couple more things that we want to cover before we're done today. Um, so how can we highlight this Wookiee in a way that's really fast? Well, you remember I talked about that brush that I had killed before, my little dry brush that I retired, this guy. Um, dry brushing is a really awesome technique that you can utilize over a lot of different miniature surfaces. Uh, it, what it does is effectively it utilizes um, a minimal amount of paint on the brush. And what happens is, is as you dry brush, you only that paint only collects on the most raised layers. So things with a lot of texture like this Wookiee fur, which is just loaded with texture, are great, are great for um, this technique. And we're just going to like dive right in and I'm going to show it to you really quick. And we're gonna have some fun. Um, if you don't, if you don't have any brushes that you want to use for dry brushing, you can use like really cheap makeup brushes. So like you can use something like this, and this will work really great for dry brushing as well. All you really need is you just need a um, brush that has a lot of open bristles that you can really get rough with. Um, so to kind of explain how this technique goes. Whoop. That's not what we wanted to do. There we go. Um, ah, come on. We're going to grab our brown. And we're going to um, put some on the brush. And then effectively, we're just going to work it off the brush. And this can work really well. This can work really, really well. Um, yeah, we'll use this one. So having a paper towel, or you can use your hand. I'm just going to use my hand. So I'm going to get paint on the brush and then I'm just going to work on my hand until you see how there's almost no color left coming off the brush but it's just hitting my raised the raised portions of my skin here that's the whole point of the dry brush um, it's important to make sure that your paint is not loose with this so you effectively don't want to add any moisture to it you want the paint to be pretty dry uh, which is why it's called a dry brush. Just straight out of the pot or the bottle is great. Um, different paints will give you different consistency results. So sometimes you may find that if you don't have to thin a paint a lot because it comes out pretty, pretty smooth and consistent, put it on your palette and let it sit for a while um, and let it kind of dry out until you get that consistency. But you can see as I go over and over this area on the Wookiee, how that color is building up. Uh, especially on his leg here. So one of the big things that you have to be careful with with dry brushing, and there's not a whole lot of finesse to dry brushing, which is the best part, at least at its basic form, um, is you want to make sure that you don't have a lot of paint in your brush. Because if you do wind up with a lot of paint, I'll show you what that looks like. So if you don't, if you don't appropriately 
squeeze your paint off in the right way, you still have too little, you're gonna get like really big smooches like right there. Now you can fix those, you know, it is possible to fix those. A lot of times if you just take your finger and like rub it, um, you can wipe it off. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, the goal is to have a really nice um, dry brush where you're building up this color over time. And I, the thing that I really love about dry brushing and the reason it's one of my favorite techniques, especially on high texture surfaces like fur and other things is that it's like magic. You start and you don't really see a difference, but the more you work over that area like this arm, the more and more you start to see the effect come through and it leaves the shadows really dark and it really picks out the edges. And it's a very fast and fun and easy technique. So this is a great, you want to use dry brushing on high texture areas, you can do it on metallics. So this is a great way to get true metallic metals um, very quickly and easily because it's just going to pick up the raised areas. Even areas that don't have a ton of texture um, still have, you know, natural uh, indents and, and declinations and stuff like that because it's not a smooth surface. Like nothing is a truly smooth surface, just like your skin has cracks and crevices in it. So going over like the blades um, of this Wookiee Warrior here, we can see uh, how dry brushing can affect those as well. If we just start with a little bit of black, um, so we'll base cut those in black. Now I'm going to go back to my previous mixture of this Thar Brown right here. And I'm going to do another dry brush um, of that over the top of the fur to really start to bring out highlights in the fur. So this I want to be even lighter, so I'm just going to use a really light touch. And I'm going to build up those layers really quick. And you can see how all of that detail is coming through. And the more I go back and forth over it, the lighter it's going to become. So as you do this, you can think about like, where's my light source coming from, just like you will with highlighting on, on a normal miniature. Um, you can do it less on like the leg that's in the back, because that's going to be in the shadow. Definitely more on the face. We want high contrast on that face. You know, we come back here and hit the arms a bit more on the tops, maybe the side of the calf and build that up. And you can keep going and going, you know, if we wanted to like maybe grab some of this white sand and go really, really high. So we want this, we want the highest contrast possible on this Wookiee. And you come out of the pot, you're totally gonna, there we go. So come out of the pot here. Um, and then we can go back to this white sands and we can really start to build up the colors really generally. Now, one of the tricks that you can do with dry brushing if you want to, is you can grab like a Thar Brown and you can just dry brush a base coat in a washed miniature with a really light dry brushing of your off-white, like your Thar Brown, and that will just naturally bring out highlights in all the colors. Um, I've seen people do that technique on their miniatures. It looks really great. If you really like dry brushing, it can be a great way to get high contrast results and kind of finish off highlighting in a quick way. Um, we're not going to do that one on this guy. On this Yoda, we're going to go a different direction. Um, but it'll be great. So there you go. So we went in about five minutes, we went from a flat brown to a pretty awesome looking, almost done Wookiee fur. Um, and this is one of the upcoming Wookiees from the new Wookiee Warriors from Public Shop coming out. Okay, I'm gonna grab, yeah. so we're gonna grab some flat black. I have the brush in my mouth like a savage. Um, we're gonna do a quick base coat of black over the swords. Ooh, didn't shake that enough. There we go. Come on out black, much better. Uh, Another good point that just got illustrated pretty well there is you do need to make sure to agitate your paints. Um, give them a good shake because the pigments and the binder will separate on you. Um, if they do that, you'll get paint that won't really cover. You'll either you'll probably just get a lot of like clear um, clear binder like that glaze medium that we were looking at. 
So give them a good shake. Some paints are more finicky than others. Um, you gotta play it by ear a lot of the times with them. You can put little agitator balls like BBs in them and stuff like that. Okay, so we're gonna set this guy aside to let that black dry. We'll come back and do the dry brushing later. I am going to pull out my secret weapon, which for streams is a hair dryer. So you're gonna hear a really loud uh, hair dryer blast because our Yoda still isn't quite dry yet. We only have so much time left. But I want this wash to be really nice and dry. There we go. Okay, right back to it. So you can see how already most of the glossiness has gone. I do see a little bit of glossiness here in these deeper folds. That just means that the wash isn't quite dry. So I'm gonna be a little careful around those areas, um, but I wanna make sure that we get through this last, um, this last step. So we have our wash looking great. Again, this Yoda could just be called tabletop ready and I think everyone would be quite happy with him. We're gonna do the last stage of the process, which is the highlight step. So just like we did with the Wookiee and his fur with the dry brushing, our goal with highlighting is to bring back the mid-tone and then accentuate the contrast between the deepest recesses and the highest peaks. So what that means is, in practice, we have our wash in all of these deep cracks. You know, we have this really nice darkness. You can see how the wash kind of pulled away from these raised areas. Um, however, we want to take back our midtone a little bit, and then we want to accentuate those, those raised areas even more. So what that's gonna look like is I'm gonna go back to my Thar Brown, uh, which is still on my palette and fairly wet, but I'm gonna add just a little bit more water to it. For a highlighting step, you do want your paints to be a bit looser than they were for your base coating step. We're gonna play with the translucency a little bit. So I'll show you what that looks like on this palette here. So you can see this was our Thar Brown that we started with. Um, so if I kind of run it over the side here, that's a pretty good consistency. Um, I could even go a little bit looser, so I might just get a little bit more wetness in there. And then you can see how it kind of stretches over the colors on the side of that palette. And what that means is, is that it's that translucency is then gonna allow us to build up really smooth layers on the miniature itself. Um, and the way we're gonna do that is it's just gonna take a little bit of brush control and a little bit of care. And this is gonna take some practice to get used to, but um, especially areas that have a lot of really great stylized detail like this cloak here, it becomes really easy to see what's going on. So I'm simply gonna look for the areas that are raised so anywhere where the cloak folds up. And I'm just gonna start drawing in lines, basically, of that Thar Brown color. And I'm going to avoid going into the deepest recesses of the cloak. So you can see here how I'm kind of like, I'm coming halfway down a little bit, down this fold. So I'm not getting in here, but I am kind of transitioning. I'm smoothing out that transition between the, deep, the darkest wash and the raised edge of the cloak. And again, um, kind of keeping your paint a little looser for this will really help. You can, if you make a mistake like I just did there, which will happen, just get your brush, clean it off, or you can do what I typically always do, is have a second clean brush that I keep a little damp nearby, and you can actually like blend away your mistake by simply using the dampness of that brush to pull the paint. And this is another strength of keeping your paints nice and nice and wet so that they flow smooth is that they're easier to blend out. And you can just blend out your mistakes. Um, so you don't have to be as concerned about you know being perfect on the first time because when you make a mistake, which we all do, I make mistakes all the time when I'm painting, you can utilize that second brush. I like to keep that second brush typically in my mouth um, because I find it really easy to switch back and forth on. Uh, but I want it to be nice and clear and and have some good, not, not sound like I had, you know, a fruit pie in my mouth the whole time I was talking to y'all. So we're just gonna kind of come through. Now, 
when you get to areas like here on the cloak that I'm doing, um, you'll notice I'm not coming in with the point and drawing with the brush. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm using the flat of the brush, which is this edge here, and I'm kind of doing a little bit of a fake dry brush. So I'm very gently running the brush over the top of where I see the detail and allowing the flat of the brush to allow the paint to pick up and build up slowly and smoothly. On these bigger areas, I'll just come in and I will happily just paint like you would normally think about painting. But if you want more control using the flat of the brush and instead kind of dragging it along and allowing it to pick up those smaller folds, those more micro folds, will get you a lot of success and you won't have to stress about like getting in there with your tiny brush and your points and all that stuff. So again, um, utilizing those tricks and a little bit of best practices, a little bit of patience, it's going to get you really, really far with a lot of success going on. I'll flip them over to the front. Like we want to do kind of this edge down the cloak. And the wash is also really great because it's going to help you kind of define where these differences will be because you're going to see where the wash pulled and where it didn't. You're going to be able to see where the wash like stretched really far and then where it kind of went in the midtones and stuff. And you're just going back through and you're just reclaiming. This is also called reclaiming your midtone. Um, and then we're going to move on really quick to our highlight. And one of the things about this kind of style of painting, and especially miniature painting in general, I'm not I'm not thinking about where the light source is hitting. So, you know, like uh, if I was doing like real, real artist kind of thinking, I'd be like, my light source is here. So everything shades from this area. Um, with miniature painting, especially this like army style of miniature painting, just pay attention to where the raised areas are and hit those. It doesn't matter if the light source would hit it differently or not. We're not trying to make we're not trying to make fancy competition art pieces. We're not trying to do anything like that. That's that's a stage that we can go to, but the destiny of this Yoda miniature here is to be an enjoyable hobby project where I sit down and I get to paint a Yoda, and then eventually he's gonna wind up on the table leading my Republic army and murdering fools with his Ataru mastery, like a Yoda should. Um, okay, so we've gone through the first step of our highlight. Again, we could call this absolutely good. We could just be done here. However, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some Mojave White. And again, we started with Thar Brown. So I'm going to mix some Mojave White into my Thar Brown to create an additional highlight. Um, this is where your flat white would come in. Just because I have a not flat white, I'm going to go ahead and just use that to mix in. Um, and again, to show you kind of on the palette, what we're looking at, whoop, it's really dirty, but we're right here. So you can see how we've kind of created a highlight to that Thar Brown by adding in some of that Mojave White. So we're looking a lot nicer in terms of just the higher areas, the higher ridges are gonna get that. We're gonna thin that down again to make sure that it's gonna flow really nice. And then we're just going to go back through and instead of doing a we're just going to thin out our lines so we're just looking now to create even thinner lines of highlight and you can do this this highlighting stage as many times as you want and each time you do it if you make a thinner and thinner line what that's going to do is it's going to smooth out the transition between your deepest shadow your wash and your biggest highlight we made a little mistake, so we're just going to clean that out. And I'm actually going to even go a little further. I want to add more Mojave White actually into it just to really punch up, just to really punch it up so that you can see kind of really quickly how these lines can really affect the contrast. So I'm I have way more Mojave White than I have Thar Brown now in my mix. I'm just going to go through and I'm going to pick out with really thin lines. And again, this will take some practice, so keep your keep your second brush, your, your eraser brush close to you. 
and we're just going to pick out some of the most raised edges, like maybe the point on the cloak here. I'm just going to draw these lines in. I'm just going to create that really high contrast, which is going to help the eye immensely pick up the natural three dimensions of the cloak at that scale and it's going to make it look more correct because our eyes going to be able to read all the different folds and micro patterning and all that good stuff so we're just helping the eye out we're just giving it all of the cues that it naturally wants to see and would see at full scale on our miniature and again the length at which you go with this step and how much highlight and contrast you put in. It's all based on what you want to do. Um, but the more you practice it, the more control you'll get, the more success you'll see, and the more you can grow your skills. And moving on from these steps, once you've mastered or feel very comfortable with, there's no mastering any skill in the hobby. And there are people who still do this professionally, just these three steps and they continue to grow and improve their skills. So you could stick with this forever. But as you move forward and you want to add extra techniques and different cooking styles, as it were, to your, to your painting repertoire, we do a lot of Zenith Prime washing. We play a lot with washes um, in our painting styles. Uh, washing can get you really great results. It kind of cheats. High contrast painting with washes allows you to effectively skip. Instead of having to do a base coat and a wash, you get to do both at the same time. Uh, and it just speeds things through really quickly. So that's a really fantastic way to kind of like move forward and um, paint even faster with results and play with that. It comes out looking very different. It's not quite as uh, it's not quite as robust in terms of its color composition and the colors are a little looser and it's a little more painterly like watercolor. It's like watercolor versus oil painting in a way. Um, but it can be a really fun technique and it can lead to different results. You can, of course, master dry brushing to the point that you are painting whole vehicles like this guy that we did on the stream. This was all done with dry brushing and stippling. That's the only technique that we use to create this vehicle texture and stuff. Um, so again, you can take dry brushing to some crazy awesome levels with that A5 speeder. Um, there's so many places to explore and so much fun to have that it's all great. There's one last thing I want to do in the last two minutes we have together. I want to give you just a really fun kind of special effect. I'm going to show you how to do some really easy glow for this lightsaber. So we're going to finish off the Yoda with a little bit of lightsaber glow. Um, glow is like really, really easy to accomplish at its basic form. And of course, there are certainly ways that you can get better and better at it. Um, the big trick is to grab a little bit of uh, off-white. So again, going back to that white sands or the Mojave white, or you can just use your flat white as well. Give a quick <coughs> base coat of white to the area. Go back to my hair dryer really quick because we only have a minute. Okay, so once that's dry, um, there are these really fun technical paints. You can just grab like your normal green for this, but I'm gonna use some techno green fluor paint. And this kind of explains, uh, shows a little bit as how you, you grow and you explore with the hobby and all that stuff, where you wanna go next. After my white is dry, I'm just gonna thin out this fluor green a little bit. And I'm just gonna do a really quick wash. This is just a wash that I'm doing with the with the fluor green over that white. And there you go. We've got a glowy green lightsaber in less than a minute. All right. Well, I hope that uh, if you're new to the hobby, you were inspired and excited to get going forward, um, that you enjoyed all of our different examples and have learned a thing or two. If you are, of course, a veteran, 
maybe you picked up some ideas or some thoughts on how to approach things differently or maybe just a new practice that you can involve uh, with your hobby to make it all the more better. There's always ways to learn from each other and have things going on great. Stay tuned. In 15 minutes, we're going to be joined by Dallas Kemp, our creative director and sculpting director, Marco. Uh, they're going to come on and they're going to explain the process, walk you through how we create our amazing miniatures that we then get to paint. Um, they're going to be talking about the plastic production process, the sculpting process, all of that good stuff. Uh, it's going to be a fascinating one. I love hearing these, these gentlemen talk about their jobs and their work. Uh, who knows, they might sneak in a couple of like sneak peeks as well. Uh, so definitely turn it, worth tuning into for that. Of course, we've got a lot of more great content going along along the day, so be sure to stay tuned, check out the schedule, and get those games in for Unconventional Warfare and Civil War. Uh, we're ready to go. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more hobbyists join in. Of course, if anybody has questions, we're always happy to answer those on our live streams, which happen uh, each week where we paint and hobby and try to bring people into the hobby as well. So with that, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you on the next one and take care. Goodbye.